Okay, everybody, we're going to get started, actually, because we've got a full house here, and um, please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Um, my name is Professor Suzanne Kim. For those of you who don't know me, I'm on the law faculty here. I'm the founder and director of the Rutgers Center for Gender, Sexuality, Law, and Policy, which I do collaboratively with many other colleagues at the law school and throughout the university, as well as many students. So we're pleased to present here this talk entitled, Bearing Faith, The Limits of Catholic Healthcare for Women of Color. And our speakers today will be presenting a new report that they released by the Public Rights Private Conscience Project and Public Health Solutions uh, by that title. And the report is quite groundbreaking and very vital in its focus which is about the rules that govern care at religiously affiliated hospitals and how that affects access to reproductive health care for women of color with specific impacts in New Jersey, and our colleagues will talk about that. So let me take a moment to thank the co-supporters for this event, and I'm very privileged to be able to thank the Public Rights Private Conscience Project at Columbia Law School, as well as co-supporters the Rutgers School of Public Health, the Center for Health Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies at the School of Public Health, the Rutgers Newark American Studies Program, the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, the Rutgers University of Newark African American and African Studies Program, and the Rutgers Law Immigrant Rights Clinic. So I'll take a moment to introduce our illustrious speakers today. Because they are so accomplished, I don't, and I want to make sure that I reserve all the time that they are due for their, for their discussion. I'm not going to state every single accomplishment they have um, achieved because we'd be here all day. But first, let me start with Elizabeth Reiner Platt. Um, Ms. Platt is the director of the Public Rights Private Conscience Project at the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law at Columbia Law School. Before joining Columbia, she was a staff attorney at uh, MFY Legal Services Mental Health Law Project. And after graduating from NYU Law School, she was a Carr Center for Reproductive Justice Fellow at A Better Balance, which actually is one of the places where you can do an externship through the Rutgers Center for Gender, Sexuality, Law, and Policy. During law school, Ms. Platt worked with the Urban Justice Sex Workers Project, the New York Civil Liberties Union, and the Brenner, Brennan Center for Justice. And in 2013, she published Gangsters to Greyhounds, the Past, Present, and Future of Offender Registration in the NYU Review of Law and Social Change. Next, we have Kira Shepard. Kira Shepard is a MSP student, former MSP student from Rutgers University of Newark. She graduated in 2011, and she is one of at least my former students, so I was absolutely delighted to cross paths with her again at Columbia. She is the director of the Racial Justice Program at the Public Rights Private Conscience Project at the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law at Columbia Law School. Before joining Columbia, she was the executive director and director of campaigns at the Black Institute, an action think tank that leads advocacy work in the areas of immigration, education, the environment, and economic justice. Next, we have Ashley Grosso, a PhD, who is a research, science, research scientist with primarily quantitative research experience in HIV epidemiology and prevention and reproductive health studies in the United States and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her research is focused on populations at high risk, including men who have sex with men and female sex workers. With her academic training in public administration, she has also completed research on the determinants effectiveness and equity of funding for HIV-related services in the United States and internationally. And last but not least, we have Renee Steinhagen, who is the founder with the late Arthur Kinoy and the executive director of the New Jersey Appleseed Public Interest Law Center, NGAA, where she's responsible for board development, communications, student interns, pro bono coordination, litigation, and other public advocacy, advocacy projects in the areas of healthcare, election reform, government, and corporate accountability and community and environmental health. 
Since 2009, Renee has represented NJA on the leadership team of the New Jersey for Healthcare Coalition, which is a consumer-based coalition focused on an array of issues arising from the implementation of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on the state level. Renee also serves on the board of the Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition, which has established a Medicaid ACO in downtown Newark and is a founding member of the Campaign to Protect Community Healthcare, which focuses on protecting the public during hospital closings or sales. So please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Thank you for that great welcome, Professor Kim. Uh, I'm honored to be welcomed by you, and I'm super happy that we reconnected recently, and since then, Professor Kim has supported me in numerous great ways in the work that I'm doing now. Um, as a Rutgers Law School alum, I'm super happy to be here right now with all of you, and I'm um, super happy to be joined here by Dean Bravo Weber, as an MSP alum. Thank you for being um, yeah, so um, my name is Kira Shepard. I'm the Director of Racial Justice for the Public Rights Private Concerts Project. The Public Rights Private Concerts Project is a think tank at Columbia Law School that focuses on religious liberty laws and looks at the ways these laws undermine um, other fundamental rights to equality and liberty. As the head of the Racial Justice Project, I focus on how religious liberty laws impact people of color. Recently, um, as Professor Kim said, our project along with Public Health Solutions came out with a report called Bearing Faith, The Limits of Catholic Health Care for Women of Color. Um, the, re the report presents new groundbreaking research that shows that a number of communities across the nation, women of color disproportionately give birth at Catholic hospitals. Um, in one of these states, is New Jersey, so we're going to be talking more about those numbers later and giving more details about what has happened in New Jersey with Catholic hospitals later. Catholic hospitals um, puts religious ideology before best medical standards of care and practice. Um, they buy by a set of directives called ethical religious directives. Has anyone here heard of ethical religious directives? Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about them throughout this talk. They're, they're, um, a lot of times we refer to them as the ERDs. So the ERD says that health care providers at Catholic hospitals um, are prevented from providing a number of different services, such as um, contraception, um, some treatments for ectopic pregnancy, uh, abortion, tubal ligation, women's having their two types, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. sterilizations, vasectomies. Um, regardless of the patient's wishes, the doctor's medical judgment, or the standards of care. The interesting thing about the ERDs is that a lot of people don't even know they exist, and a lot of people actually go to Catholic hospitals don't even know that the, the Catholic hospitals abide by these, these ERDs. Many Catholic hospitals don't have names such as you know, St. Michael's or St. Luke's, especially ones that have recently merged. Um, for instance, we're going to talk later about a Catholic hospital by name of Mercy Health Partners. Um, so if someone went to a Catholic hospital by that name, they would have no idea that they follow these, these guidelines. Um, a recent report actually showed that 37% of patients that go to Catholic hospitals don't even real, realize that they're religiously affiliated. In recent years, Catholic hospitals have grown. Um, a recent report by Merger Watch shows that one in six hospital beds is actually in a Catholic hospital. Um, the reason for this growth has to do with consolidation in the healthcare industry. So in 1990, we had more independent hospitals, including Catholic hospitals, merging with larger health systems for economic reasons. The ERDs, which were written by um, a group called the United States um, Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, when they found out about these mergers, they decided to expand the scope of the ERDs to put restrictions on these partnerships. So they said they were doing it in a way to you know, help spread the, the gospel of the church, but in practice, what this meant 
um, was that when these mergers happened, oftentimes the non-Catholic hospital had to go by the, the ERDs, follow the ethical and religious directions of the Catholic hospitals. Up until today, there haven't been many challenges, legal challenges. And here is an example of excerpts from the ethical and religious directives. Um, up until today, there haven't been a lot of legal challenges to the um, ethical and religious directives, but one particular case that a lot of people know about is the case of Tanisha Means. Um, Tanisha Means was 18 weeks pregnant when she went to the only hospital in her community, which happened to be a Catholic hospital. Um, she was in a lot of pain. The doctors operated, they, they examined her, they realized that uh, her pregnancy, the fetus was no longer viable. They realized that the best standard of care would have been to evacuate the uterus at this point. But nor did they inform Tanisha Means of this. They didn't tell her she should go to a different hospital. They just sent her home with a pain um, reliever. The next day, she went back to the same hospital and they examined her again and realized she had an infection and she was on the um, verge of a condition called a life threatening condition known as sepsis. Um, they still just sent her home. Um, later that night, she came back to the hospital and she was miscarrying, and then they had to. Um, attend to her. They continued to send her home because they did, they, they, at the time they detected a fetal heartbeat. So under the directives, that's considered an abortion. So, but they didn't even give her um, any idea of what was happening to her or why they were treating her the way they were treating her. So luckily for her, um, a woman who working at the hospital at that time told her she was talking to someone at the ACLU, which she did. Um, the ACLU brought a negligence claim against the hospital, um, and no, they brought a negligence claim against the United um, States Conference of Catholic Bishops, who wrote the Ethical Religious Directives, and against the chairs of the Catholic um, Health Ministries, who um, required the hospital to abide by the directives. Um, and they lost at the district level, and then they appealed the case to, serve, um, to the Sixth Circuit Court, of appeals, and they lost at the appellate level because the court said that she didn't have a present physical injury. Now, she, she was in a lot of pain, yeah, but they just said it just wasn't enough. She didn't have a present physical injury, so, the, so nothing, she lost the case, basically. Interestingly enough, and the reason that you know we're here is to, to talk about how these um, hack hospitals, how these directives impact all women, people, women of color, um, there's a number of hospitals um, in New Jersey, and the, the situation is a lot of people just don't know that these hospitals survive by these directives, and they don't know when they're treated like that, it's like similar to Tanisha Means, that it's because of the, the ethical religious directives. In, the, in our report, we, um, we highlight the story of a woman named um, Lori Bertram Roberts, who was 18 years old, uninsured, similar situation as Tanisha Means. She was like 12 weeks pregnant, went to the only um, hospital in her area, um, wasn't even given a pain reliever, turned away twice. Um, third time, she was, she was at home hemorrhaging. Um, she passed out on her bathroom floor. They had to call the ambulance. They finally brought her back to the hospital. She was 18 at the time. She didn't know two years later that it happened to her because of the directives. So we think it's really important to like, educate people about the directives. One thing that we, um, in our report, that we highlight outside of the to share numbers of women of color who are exposed to the directives um, is the fact that the ethical and religious directors exacerbate and compounds many of the health and racial disparities that women of color already face. So um, a number of you might have followed the ProPublica NPR investigation about um, maternal mortality in America. If you have, you, if you haven't, you should. Um, but in that investigation, they talk about how um, healthcare disparities facing women of color, especially Black and Latina women, um, is a huge issue. With Black women being three times more likely to die during childbirth. So realizing this, when we wrote the report, we really wanted to 
focus on how these directives kind of just restrict women from accessing the care they desperately need when they need it the most, you know, during childbirth. <coughs> In the report, we talk about the different ways that healthcare disparities um, are compounded by the ethical and religious directives. Like for instance, black and Latino women are more likely to be uninsured than white women. Um, if you're uninsured, you're not going to receive the prenatal care that you need. You're just not going to receive the health care you need, period. And if you don't receive care that you need, then there's a higher chance you're going to run into pregnancy complications such as Tamisha Means and Lori Bertram Roberts. And in such a case, you're going to need the best type of reproductive health care and you're not going to receive that um, at a Catholic hospital. Women of color are more likely to have um, an unintended pregnancy for a number of reasons. Um, lack of access to quality um, birth control, um, lack of access to comprehensive um, sexual education. So women of color, Latina and um, black women are three to four times more likely to have an unintended um, pregnancy, respectively. Um, a recent report showed that because Catholic hospitals don't allow tubal ligations, the number of tubal ligations across the nation has gone down by like 30% since the, the expansion of Catholic hospitals. Um, a woman that I recently spoke to who worked at a Catholic hospital said that she actually saw women go into the hospital, request a tubal ligation after they, they give birth, like after they give pregnancy, um, after they have a baby, and they don't find out until they're actually like on the operating table that the, the Catholic hospital won't tie their tubes. And then she said after the, the particular woman had a child, months later they would see that same woman come in pregnant. Um, so this is something that's hurting our communities. Um, and lastly, um, one study, a number of studies have showed that racial <coughs> biases contribute to black patients being undertreated for pain. Um, so a lot of doctors believe that black patients can actually um, withstand more pain than white patients. So because of that, they undertreat them for pain. So in the report, I talk about um, how this type of bias can definitely impact um, black women. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of the case of Tamisha Means where they sent her home with a pain reliever and she was in excruciating pain. And we're not really sure if that bias came into play or not, but it definitely begs the question. Um, and by pain reliever, mm -hmm. you mean like Tylenol, right? Was what they, they didn't give her. They, they, I don't think they gave her Tylenol because they're not allowed, but they gave her, they gave her yeah, just something, something small like, like that. Yeah, over the counter. <laughs> yeah. So nothing, yeah, that's really going to take away something that would barely be suitable for cramps, you know, Mr. Cramps. Um, so as I said, this is a, an important issue and we're trying to get the word out and Liz is going to talk more about um, some of the federal and state laws that give healthcare providers to go cover. Um, so I think the, the question kind of that comes up most fr frequently when we tell the, the stories of, of Tamisha Means and Floyd Roberts is how is this legal? How can this happen? How can someone be sent home from a hospital? All, they are in the middle of discharging her for a fourth time without treatment when she, you know, miscarried in the, the waiting room of the hospital. How can this happen? Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the laws that um, sort of allow and support uh, the ethical and religious directives and allow hospitals to put their religious beliefs um, uh, before um, the standard of care for their patients. Um, and I'm going to say, um, just as a word of warning, I'm going to be talking about a lot of federal and state religious uh, exemption laws. That said, um, I don't think that what happened to Tamisha Means is or should be, uh, it is legal under our current um, health laws, right? So you have religious uh, refusal laws, but you also have a number of laws that are out there to help protect patients and patients' rights. Um, there's, for example, a, a law called EMTALA that prohibits hospitals from discharging patients during a, a medical emergency without stabilizing them. Um, and because of a lack of case law and a lack of case law that um, seriously uh, considers um, what happens when a religious refusal law conflicts with patient health care or with um, a, a law like EMTALA that requires um, some sort of duty to the patient, um, we, we just don't have a clear legal line 
for when um, when a patient's health has to take priority over a religious refusal law. We don't the the, the case law isn't there. So I'm going to be talking about these religious refusal laws, but I don't want you to get the idea that what happened to Tamisha Means is perfectly legal. I don't think it is. Um, and the reason it was dismissed in that case is not because they said yes, the religious religious hospital gets to do whatever they want. It was kind of shoved away because they said, oh, well, she wasn't really harmed. So they didn't get to the meat of the issue, which is, can they can they harm a patient? I, I know. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, I, yes, I disagree with that aspect of the case, of course, but in some ways, I mean, I would rather that they say that than that they say, absolutely, you have the right to harm your patients because they're a religious hospital, right? I mean, neither, neither case is great, but um, so um, to, to outline then some of the religious refusals laws that do currently exist, um, uh, we have shortly after Roe v. Wade, uh, Congress passed the Church Amendment. Uh, it's not named after churches, it's named after Senator Frank Church. Um, and that says that healthcare entities that receive federal funds, and that just by like, includes basically every hospital, because every hospital gets federal funds and, uh, um, because they always you know, get Medicare, paid in Medicare funding, um, are not required to perform any sterilization procedure or abortion if this would be contrary to their religious or moral convictions. Um, and that entities that receive these funds uh, may not discriminate, and I think that's a strange word to use, but we can talk about that later, may not discriminate against healthcare professionals um, because they have performed or because they refuse to perform sterilizations or abortions um, where this conflicts with their religious or moral beliefs. Um, now, at first glance, if you don't think about it too hard, this almost seems balanced. Well, you know, healthcare entities, they can't discriminate you if, against you if you um, have performed an abortion or if you won't perform an abortion. But actually, it's a really a one-sided right because um, a Catholic hospital can forbid any of its employees from providing um, an abortion. And a lot of abortion docs, if you talk to them, um, it, it is their religious and moral beliefs that are driving them to provide abortion care. And particularly if you look at the case like Tanisha Means, I think many, many providers would say, it's part of my religious or moral beliefs to provide care to a patient in need. However, in that scenario, the religious beliefs of the entity of the hospital take, take control, and they can forbid doctors um, from providing uh, abortions or sterilizations, regardless of the religious beliefs of the provider. If you flip it, however, um, what they can't do um, is they can't uh, discriminate, they can't hire some, refuse to hire someone because they provide that kind of care outside of the scope of their employment. That's not to say they never do discriminate on that basis, but theoretically, one could bring a claim saying um, we're not, uh, you know, you could say like you can't discriminate against someone because they, they moonlight at Planned Parenthood, let's say. Um, if you flip it, however, a secular hospital, let's say, cannot require their um, doctors to provide care even during emergency situations. Um, for their patients. So um, if you're anti-abortion, if you never want to provide abortion, you never have to, regardless of what kind of facility you work in. If you want to provide abortion, if you want to provide re comprehensive reproductive health care, you can only do that if your employer allows you. So it's, it, it seems balanced, but it's, it's not. So that's the Church Amendment. Um, uh, the 1997 Balanced Budget Act extended religious refusals to cover not just entities who are actually providing health care, but um, insurance plans that pay for it. Uh, so it contains a provision saying that Medicare and Medicaid managed care programs need not provide reimbursement for or provide coverage of a counseling or referral service um, if the organization offering the plan objects to the provision of such service on moral or religious grounds. Um, so this, this greatly expands the scope of who can refuse. It also, um, I think is particularly harmful because as, as hard as it is, it is to say, like, go to a different doctor, go to a different hospital, I mean, I think that in and of itself is un puts an unfair burden on patients to have to know what their doctor believes, know what kind of care they're not receiving, and then go find somewhere else, particularly during an emergency situation. Um, I think it's even harder to expect them to try to find another insurance plan that covers the care that they might one day need, right? Um, 
There's also the um, Weldon Amendment, which was not, it's not written into law exactly, but it, it has been attached to an annual labor, health, and education appropriations bill every year since 2004. Um, and this prohibits um, federal agencies, federal programs, and state and local governments um, that receive money under the bill from, again, discriminating um, against healthcare entities because they refuse to provide, pay for, um, or refer for abortions. So this, again, extends the scope of religious refusals even further to cover anything that's getting funding, um, you know, even through state and local programs that receive money from the federal government. So, uh, you know, in some ways it, it restricts a state or local program from saying, we're going to use this money to ensure that people get comprehensive reproductive health care, including abortion. You know, it ties their hands um, under that bill. Um, and then there are many, 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 many state bills that kind of do um, very similar things that provide some sort of affirmative right to, to decline to provide uh, uh, health care. Some of it, um, there, so there are 45 state bills that have passed um, abortion, refusal laws, abortion refusal laws for individual providers. 43 states have passed them for institutions. 18 states have refusal laws related to sterilization. And 12 states have refusal laws um, related to contraceptive services. Um, a few states go even broader and basically say you get to refuse any kind of care that conflicts with your religious or moral beliefs. Um, and what you're actually being exempted from, some of them sort of shield people from just civil lawsuits, you know, tort lawsuits, malpractice, whatever. Um, some even go so far as to protect folks from potential cr criminal lawsuits. So even if they're engaging in behavior that could arguably um, amount to a criminal violation, and I'm not sure what exactly that looks like, but that it, they are protected under these um, uh, state health care refusal laws um, that say, you know, you have the right to refuse this kind of health care, absolutely, if it conflicts with your religious or moral beliefs. Um, possibly the broadest state refusal right now is in Mississippi. Um, uh, which says that uh, healthcare institutions um, can decline to provide or participate in the healthcare service that violates its conscience and um, shall not be civilly, criminally, or administratively liable, uh, in, so long as the institution provides a consent form. Um, so basically, it said, you know, they, they give someone a boilerplate form, and, it mean, and, and that means they're absolutely protected from denial of any type of counseling or care, not just reproductive health care, um, and there's no exception for medical emergencies. Um, so clearly, uh, the exemptions are already <coughs> broad, uh, but we're seeing efforts from policymakers and advocates to um, expand uh, religious refusal laws even more broadly. Um, you know, right at the, at the federal level, uh, Congress our, our Congress members repeatedly have introduced the Abortion Non-Discrimination Act, which would write the Walden Amendment in a, into permanent law rather than have it as having it as an annual appropriations bill, um, and would actually expand the kinds of federal funds that it would apply to. Um, on the state level, we're seeing new and ever broader religious health care refusal laws introduced every year. And you also may have heard of the recently um, proposed uh, HHS um, religious refusal regulation, uh, and that is a regulation that um, the folks may see. Has anyone heard of this new HHS conscience? Okay, right. So HHS just introduced a, a proposed regulation. Um, the comment period, unfortunately, is closed, or else I would urge you to all put in comments. But um, uh, that interprets the existing federal religious refusal laws um, in the absolute most expansive way possible. You know, for instance, you know. The current law allows um, a, a religious refusal to um, refer patients for abortion care. Um, this, this proposed uh, exact um, rule interprets the word um, refer to include the provision of information where they believe that information could ultimately lead to someone getting an abortion. So can, can you imagine the amount of information that could be withheld under this provision? Um, and also, just to give you a sense, uh, again, this, the motivation and the, the language that they use in this proposed uh, rule is all about conscience, conscience, religious freedom, religious, 
And look, we are, no one on this panel is against religious freedom, but I think it's really important to realize that people have an enormous range of religious views about abortion. Religious rights doesn't mean anti-abortion, and I, I think if you look at the text of the law, they're not, they're not respecting religious belief, they're only concerned for um, those with anti-abortion religious beliefs. Um, and, and no concern for the religious views of the individual providers working at these institutions or for the patient's own religious and moral beliefs. So I, I think that's a, a, a piece that is important to remember. Um, and then the um, final thing is that this proposed rule um, gives the uh, office, the HHS Office for Civil Rights, really broad um, power, including investigating entities even uh, when there's no complaint against them, um, which is troubling. So I think they could certainly essentially try to go out looking for, um, for healthcare facilities to sue, um, even if there's no complaint against them. And HHS estimates that this new division will require um, $312.3 million in its first year and $125 million annually in the second through fifth years. Um, in contrast, the fiscal year uh, 2018 HHS budget for the entire Office of Civil Rights, so the, the body that enforces all other health anti-discrimination laws, race discrimination, sex discrimination, et cetera, um, how much do folks think that division gets? It's 33 million, right? So we have 312 million for just this religious refusal, 33 million for all other discrimination in healthcare. Um, okay, so uh, so again, I you know I do want to end sort of similarly saying um, the landscape looks really bad, right? In my view, um, there are all these religious refusal laws, but I I don't um, think that means. Uh, that, that what is being done um, doesn't violate many of these other health and safety laws, and, and I hope that some of the lawsuits that folks are currently pursuing to try to um, ensure that uh, a religious refusal law does not, um, it is not intended to allow for the denial of information or emergency medical care, um, I hope those uh, um, success in the courts. Um, and, um, and, and there have been, you know, a few little, you know, pieces of, of hopeful direction. So, you know, I was, there's been cases where, um, oh, okay, I'll stop, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. No, I don't think yours came so I'm happy to be here because I'm also an alum of Rutgers right across the way at the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Oh. Anybody here from there? Mm -hmm. Hi. Do you know where it is? Knowledge from public health solutions, Marianne Chasson, Diana Bermudez, and Claudette McKenzie, who worked on data acquisition, entry, and analysis. We also acknowledge the state vital statistics departments that provided data for this study, but all interpretations are our own and do not reflect those of these organizations. As a quick overview of this presentation, I'll speak briefly about prior research on the topic, talk about how we obtained and analyzed vital statistics data present results from across the U.S. and also from New Jersey specifically, and mention some areas for further research. Most public health research on the ethical and religious directives has been conducted with providers who work at religiously affiliated healthcare institutions. This research has found that many Catholic hospitals do not describe on their websites what services are restricted, and providers also report that referrals are not always provided to women to secular hospitals providing these services, consistent with what this is suggesting. Patient surveys have shown that women expect that comprehensive reproductive health services will be provided to them, even at a Catholic hospital. These issues are particularly concerning for women of color. A study showed that African American were more, women were more likely than white women to say it is important to know a hospital's religion and Latina women were more likely than white women to say it's important to know hospital religious restrictions. Sometimes people might assume that many Latina women are Catholics, so they would go to a Catholic institution, but clearly they care about these restrictions. 
And Catholic women are about equally likely to have abortions and use contraception compared to other women. So we've seen that hospitals have these restrictions and women care about them, but what are the effects on patient outcomes? One key service women might seek at a hospital where they give birth is postpartum contraception or sterilization. Research has shown that when one particular Catholic hospital stopped providing postpartum depo for non-contraceptive reasons, not surprisingly, pregnancy rates went up in the, among adolescent and young women. Another multi-state study found that changes in hospital Catholic affiliation led to about a 30% decrease in both tubal ligations and abortions. Again, we see disproportionate concerns for women of color and that those most affected were Hispanic women. But we wanted to know whether women of color were not just more likely to want to know about these religious affiliations and restrictions, but whether they were more likely to access these health systems for care. So our research question was, are women of color more likely to give birth at a Catholic hospital than white women? We use giving birth as a proxy for accessing reproductive health care because the data are more readily available than data on other procedures such as miscarriages. We also assume that women are giving birth at a hospital that is geographically close to them and accepts their insurance, and this would likely be the hospital where they would seek other types of care. We asked states for the number of births at each hospital to non-Hispanic white women, non-Hispanic black women, Hispanic women, and women of any other race. We define women of color as any race other than non-Hispanic white. 33 states in Puerto Rico provided data from the most recent year available, which varied by state ranging from 2013 to 2016. New Jersey's was 2015. We then used MergerWatch's list of Catholic hospitals to calculate the number of births to women of color at Catholic hospitals and the number of births to women of color at non-Catholic hospitals. We found that for all states combined, about 18% of women of color gave birth at a Catholic hospital, compared to about 16% of white women. At Catholic hospitals, 53% of births were to women of color, compared to 49% of births at non-Catholic hospitals. This may seem small, but this 53% here is 306,936 women of color. So when you look across the nation, it adds up. We looked at state-specific data for a few reasons. One is that is how vital statistic systems are set up in the US, so we had to get data from each state separately. But also states vary in the number of Catholic hospitals and in their racial and ethnic diversity. According to MergerWatch, one in six hospital beds in the U.S. is in a facility operating under the ERDs, as Kara mentioned. But as you can see in this map, that some states have more options than others. Alaska, for example, has the highest percentage of beds that are at Catholic hospitals. So the disparities that we found exist at the individual state level in 19 states, in dark blue on this map, where women of color were more likely to give birth at a Catholic hospital than white women. You can see that this doesn't completely match up to the map of where the most Catholic hospitals are located. So both New Mexico, which had only one Catholic hospital, and Wisconsin, where one quarter of the birth hospitals are Catholic, have racial disparities in births. The disparities were also not completely due to the demographic of the state. For example, Maine is one of the least racially diverse states, yet it had the third highest disparity. Maryland is very diverse, and it had the second highest disparity. So further research is needed into why this is the case. We think it may be due to the catchment area of the hospitals at a zip code level, and possibly due to what's hospitals in network for women's insurance plans. To go over some other information on the map, shown in light blue, in 11 states in Puerto Rico, we found the opposite, opposite of what we expected, that in fact, non-Hispanic white women were more likely to give birth in a Catholic hospital compared to women of color. In two states, shown in light green, there were no significant differences, so the percentages were nearly the same. Shown in dark green, seven states did not have any Catholic birth hospitals. And for the states in gray, we did not have data available for a variety of reasons. Costs were prohibited in three states. Uh, some states like North Dakota have very small populations, are not very diverse, and have a small number of hospitals. So for confidentiality, confidentiality reasons, they could not provide the data because it might be considered identifiable. Uh, and in Colorado, we needed to get permission from the one Catholic hospital system running all their Catholic hospitals, which they did not provide to us. Again, while the national differences were small but significant, the disparities were starker in other states. 
for nipple in New Jersey, we found the highest disparity of any other state. So any statistics speaks, the odds ratio was the highest, 3.4. Um, now New Jersey, six out of 58 Catholic birth hospitals, 60 out of eight, sorry, six out of 58 birth hospitals were Catholic in 2015, about 10%. So women of color in New Jersey were more than three times more likely than white women to give birth at Catholic hospitals. Eighty percent of births at Catholic hospitals in New Jersey were to women of color, compared to only 53 percent of births at non-Catholic hospitals. The disparity is especially significant for Hispanic women here in New Jersey. While approximately one in 25 births to white women occurs in a facility following the ERDs, at four percent. The number for Hispanic women is closer to 1 in 6, 17%. And despite the fact that white women had over 15,000 more births than Hispanic women overall, Hispanic women had over twice the number of births at Catholic hospitals than white women, 4,714 versus 1,735. Going forward, we've identified areas of future research. One is to examine the characteristics of the geographic areas served by Catholic and non-Catholic hospitals. Uh, we started doing this using data on patient zip codes in the census on racial demographics, and this can be expanded to include factor, other factors such as poverty and median income. We also want to learn more about the impact of the ERDs on women, including women of color. As I said, there are a few studies on health outcomes at Catholic hospitals compared to other hospitals. Another potential project would be to develop, implement, and evaluate interventions with Catholic hospitals. For example, what would happen if Catholic hospital were to increase transparency by providing patients with information about what services are not offered? I suspect it would not har harm the hospital financially very much, but it could be very helpful to a small subset of women seeking these services. And finally, well, we know of some court cases involving transgender people who are denied services such as hysterectomies at Catholic hospitals, including here in New Jersey. Uh, we need more studies of the extent of this impact. So one idea we have is a secret shopper study to compare Catholic and non-Catholic hospitals. But overall, the impact of further restrictions on uh, LGBT people, I think, will be an area for future research in this current environment. And with that, I thank you for your time, and would love to hear questions and comments at the end. Thanks. Thank you. And Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'm going to put a little perspective on this because my work is not national, but is purely New Jersey oriented. I'm just going to speculate. I can tell you the reason of uh, my speculation of why you have those statistics in New Jersey it has to do with the historical development of hospitals in general and non-public hospitals. And that's where <coughs> New Jersey apathy comes into the story. Um, we developed a project, um, I could say it's now over 20 years ago, around the time where non-profit hospitals were starting to convert to for-profit. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> okay. And it's based on, I'm going to give you a little hint here right now. Um, it's based on the notion, I don't know how many of you have taken um, property law, but something called common, um, the charitable trust doctrine. Has anybody heard about this? Okay. Um, simply put, What's the difference between a for-profit corporation and a non-profit corporation? A non-profit corporation has a mission, and it has a prohibition against private enormment. A for-profit corporation can be organized for any purpose. So what does that mission, the mission do to the non-profit organization? We, there's something called, uh, it comes from old trust law. Um, where you have a mission, and not only do you have a, a director of this corporation, not only has an obligation to its members, its board, a, a duty of care, and a duty of loyalty, but in the context of a nonprofit corporation, we've been arguing and developing the theory of, in the context of nonprofit hospitals, that they have a duty to the mission of the hospital. So, what has happened is when you when you no longer can uh, fulfill the mission of your organization, the old trust law said the money goes back to the donor unless there's something what we call the side prey doctrine, as similar as possible the purposes of the hospital. So that has resulted um, in New Jersey and in some other parts of the country of where when a, a nonprofit hospital goes to a for-profit, the full fair value market of that hospital has to remain in the nonprofit sector dedicated to that hospital. I'm going to leave you. So it was with this concept of charitable trust, mission, 
that I ventured into the world of Catholic and the EDRs. Okay? Um, New Jersey, um, and I'm just going to say in the context of how did I develop a, uh, an advocacy um, position, New Jer in New Jersey, unlike many other states, the Attorney General is not considered what we call the exclusive enforcer of charitable trusts. In most other states, and in many states where um, these issues have arisen, people are denied standing to even make the challenge about how the hospital operates or what the hospital's doing or it, whether it's entering into a sales contract or uh, because the attorney general in that state is considered to be the exclusive enforcer of charitable trusts. Um, City of Patterson versus Patterson General Hospital is a Supreme Court case here in New Jersey in the context of a Patterson General Hospital moving out of Patterson, moving to what I have now figured out to be Passaic and turned into Passaic General Hospital. And it was challenge, uh, a challenge happened by community residents saying, you're abandoning us, you're abandoning our mission uh, to this community. And in that case is where the court really said, the community has standing to bring this. New Jersey's not uh, an enforcer. So here I had this, this standing ability to do. And lo and behold, um, so I wanted to say, if anybody's interested, that case, and I didn't write down the site since I didn't want to be pedantic here, is a very interesting case where the judge is sort of saying, what's this like? It's like a regular corporation. It's a nonprofit corporation. Is it like a trust? What are the level and the scrutiny of fiduciary duties? And so it's a very interesting case. He came up with this balance and said, charitable corporations, charitable nonprofit corporations. They're a little bit like trusts. They're a little bit like corporations but you have a fiduciary duty to the mission. So in that context comes in my door, and a lot of what you have to understand about advocacy and the reason for education here is a lot of this is networks and who you know. Um, a woman named Ellen Samuels was on the board of the ACLU New Jersey, and her physician was the head of gynecology at Elizabeth General Hospital. This was in I didn't look it up, it might be 1997, 1998, 1999, around then. Elizabeth General Hospital was now merging with St. Elizabeth's. All of you may know Trinitas now, very major healthcare system. Catholic system. And so representing, um, and what, what I wanted to say, so through this work, I, a little aside, what I want to say with your answer to your question, I spent a lot of time in this project. I also did it in terms of the conversion of New Jersey uh, Horizon Health Insurance. Spent a lot of time looking at the corporate documents. What exactly is the mission? And when you see in these Catholic institutions, I'd like you to know there is nothing usually in the corporate, the article, certificate of corporation in New Jersey that says anything about the directives. All right? The mission does not say anything about the directives. Maybe in the bylaws of the organization will they say that they're governed by the uh, directives. But what you will see is the notion of healing, the, the notion of the mission of Jesus and healing and the poor. And so what you know from a geographical point in view of New Jersey and how hospitals developed, mainly in northern New Jersey, they were developed in a lot of these hospitals are eight, late 1800s. And they were Jewish, Catholic, very few secular. It's very interesting. And so what you have is the hospitals remaining in the inner cities, even the smaller inner cities, whether it was what was remaining in Orange, at one point was a Catholic institution. Orange Memorial Hospital was a Catholic institution. Newark had St. Mike's, St. James, Columbus, Trenton, had um, Our Lady of uh, Trenton has St. Francis. Um, Trinitas monopolizes Elizabeth. St. Mary's is the only hospital left in Passaic after a Jewish hospital and a secular hospital disappeared. So what you have, Passaic County itself, which is a high Hispanic population, does not have a single secular hospital. St. Joe's Health System and St. Mary's dominate. So that might answer some of 
why are uh, women of color being serviced uh, in Catholic hospitals in New Jersey? It's a function of geography. So I want to tell you, in Elizabeth General, I went to court. I represented the head of gynecology. And I represented some of his patients. And under the charitable trust doctrine, we were able to create what you call a charitable trust settlement. Um, that was money put aside. Uh, it was given and monitored and dispersed and held by Planned Parenthood. I think at that time, I'm, I don't understand the, the dynamics of that. It was in, headquartered in Morristown. Um, and that charitable trust settlement stands today. Um, it was to subsidize abortion for women of low income in the catchment area of Elizabeth, to provide transportation services for them to be able to go to hospitals. And it was a very interesting um, issue, because right then and there, I became aware of the issue of referrals. And it was mainly in the context of HIV counseling. Um, the lack, uh, Elizabeth General Hospital had a very strong program of distributing condominiums and dealing with HIV patients, and that was going to end. And I can just tell you, in the settlement discussions, I was, I was put aside on, to deal with that, um, and I, whether it's accurate or not, I was told, don't worry about it, the sisters in St. Elizabeth will deal with it. So that's just something I want to just bring up here. There seems to be, from a practical sense, though not on a formal sense, a distinction between Catholic hospitals that are directly operated under the guidance of an archdiocese or the Pope directly, and some of these other orders uh, that emerged out of medieval times of nurses that were midwives. So, so I can't tell you if that was true or not true. Uh, following our victory in Elizabeth, um, we brought a similar case. Uh, we brought a similar case when Rancocas Hospital. I don't. It's located on near. I took the Garden State. I, it's down south, sort of, cat around Camden. Was being purchased by Our Lady of the Lords. Um, there, we did not have, as I say, we didn't have someone from the inside. We could not get any of the personnel of Rancocas to let us represent them. And we were slam dunk, kicked out of court. You know, we represented Planned Parenthood, the judge was hostile, and he basically told us we had no place in the courtroom, we had no standing, etc. cetera. Um, similarly, before, um, at that point, we were, I was uh, contacted by the head of gynecology at Christ Hospital. Now, just so you know, Christ Hospital is not a Catholic institution, so your name cannot give you away. Christ Hospital is run by the Archdiocese, Canterbury Archdiocese, a Methodist sort of hospital. They were being merged with um, Bun Secor, the Sisters of Bun Secor, which is a Catholic institution. Um, Bun Secor was buying Christ, and it was buying something called St. Mary's in Hoboken at the time which had already been a Catholic institution. Long story short, it's a very interesting transaction. It was negotiated that they did not merge totally. There was a holding company, and the two institutions had separate. And, and Christ was allowed to operate not governed by the, the directives. But it agreed not to do abortions, but they created an abortion site off campus down the block. They, they continued to do tubules. Um, we were very satisfied. Uh, I remember Lenore Lapidus was her name at the women's uh, program at the ACLU. We were, this was a good settlement. It was a good deal. Um, it didn't last long. And some people say it was a divorce that happened. Bon Secours left the state. Um, some people say it was because they continued to do tubules at Christ. You know what I mean? So that was not that. Um, also, at this time, Wayne Hospital was sold to St. Joe's Hospital uh, by Barnabas, St. Barnabas, also not Catholic, St. Barnabas, not a Catholic institution. And we negotiated a charitable trust uh, on behalf of the Planned Parenthood of Patterson that also continued to subsidize uh, work for low-income women, and uh, etc. Then happened a law called Community Healthcare Assets Protection Act, which uh, New Jersey Appleseed um, helped write and get passed, which governs all conversions 
of, of hospitals. So post Chapa, it, it, what's good about I call it Chapa is it codifies the right of standing for the citizens to participate in the hearing. So now we have Passaic Beth Israel, per, previously who had purchased Passaic General, which I think was the general from Patterson case, purchased by St. Mary's. And we held up the approval. Appleseed held up the approval until we worked out that patients would be referred to, at that time, a women's center at what was Barnard Hospital. Barnard Hospital, very interesting to know, was um, established in the late 1800s by a, a wealthy Jewish textile, German Jewish man, and he actually put into the land covenants non-discrimination in terms of hiring, non-discrimination in terms of patients, and a general, uh, you have to serve everybody and provide them everything. And for years, that covenant pre prevented the merger of St. Joe's Hospital and Barnard because Barnard, they could not sell that hospital to a Catholic institution because of the land restriction that Mr. Barnard put in there. Um, unfortunately, Barnard has since closed. And um, my understanding is that there is outpatient surgery going on in there by a bunch of physicians. They were the main providers of abortion and tubals in Passaic County. Again, Passaic itself, high Hispanic population, um, Patterson, large uh, people of color. There is no hospital that provides these services. Now, I also want to just add, as I finish the story here, the directives also affect end of life. And that's a very important thing. As more and more people are choosing to develop living wills and trying to take control over their uh, health care, the Catholic health systems, the EDRs, do not let them respect end of life directives. Um, so that's just another aspect of this. This has to do with when you're dealing with HIV, <coughs> just generally for you to know that. Um, interesting enough, now I'm going to go to the other side. These are post Chapa. St. Mary's in Hoboken was going to close, and, um, and I'm going to leave the politics out of it. It became a, a, a public institution. Um, and therefore, we went from an institution with directives to an institution without directives. Uh, we had here in Newark the closing of St. James and Columbus Hospital. And I would like you to know, due to the advocacy, Appleseed, our awareness of the directives, etc., what was worked out was um, prenatal women maternal health for patients in the Ironbound in St. James, went immediately to Beth Israel in the South Ward. People from the North Ward that were previously served by Columbus get their their health care now from Clara Moss. So in one sense, in Newark, we have isolated St. Michael's. And again, there are statistics that will have changed. But right now, I would rest assured that uh, most women in Newark can receive their health care in a secular institution. Mr. Adler, there's only one birth at St. Michael's in the year. So. OK, in the year. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I don't know, but that was just my hypothesis. Uh, Saint, but I'm going to tell you a story about St. Mike's. Um, it's St. Mike's uh, and St. Mary's and St. Clair's, which is in a suburb of New Jersey, were sold to Prime Healthcare for a profit. And um, Prime agreed to accept the non the directives. That, that is, uh, Prime's a major actor nationally, and I think that should be looked at. They go into urban hospitals. They've been going in Rhode Island especially. They buy Catholic hospitals, and how they outbuy other people is they, they agree to accept the directives, even though they themselves are a, not, a secular nonprofit. Um, we have tried, uh, Merger Watch and myself, we have tried. Um, right now, um, so that's a big issue. Uh, one of the ways, as I said, Prime wins is promising to maintain the directives. And the more we can get community support against the directives, or at least um, that could have been a way to try to raise opposition to that sale to this for-profit. 
Um, now I understand Our Lady of the Lords, a major hospital in Trenton, is potentially being purchased by Virtua, a nonprofit secular institution. So we are going to need help uh, in advocating and trying to pressure Virtua not to accept the directives. I have no idea if that is part of the deal, but Our Lady of the Lords, um, I believe, is um, controlled by the Archdiocese. So that might be part of the deal. Um, so I just want to say to you that the change in mission and the discussion about the mission is an important thing. It's very difficult uh, in the context of, let's say, Passaic Beth Israel, which was a Jewish hospital. I had a hard time trying to understand what did it mean to be a Jewish hospital? What did it mean to be a Methodist hospital? Um, it really became historically to fight discrimination against physicians of those uh, theologies. And in the practice of medicine, other than the Catholic institution, or if there was a Christian scientist church, a uh, hospital, I don't know, it seems that the Catholic directives, from my perspective as someone who advocates through the lens of change of mission and advocates for um, continuity of services when there's a change in mission, um, the Catholic institution is the only one who you can directly translate it into services versus not services. Do you understand that there are clearly delineated services that Catholic hospitals will not provide, including referrals, including information about your situation, and including um, having to do with reproductive services, having to do with choice of survival between, if you are in a situation between it's your life or your fetus's life, they will not give you a choice. Um, and end of life. So um, I just say that in the context of New Jersey, these issues, the more we educate people, in the context of change of ownership, uh, we, have a, we have a space there to raise these questions and advocate and bring uh, more, more um, information to the community being infected um, when they're faced with uh, a Catholic hospital, only having a Catholic hospital in there. And I, I think, I guess it would be from now a major place if, as we go forward, would probably be in the Elizabeth area where Trinitas is the sole provider of, of, of care. Okay. Thank you. And, in, and in Passaic. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, just being conscious of time, I, I realize we're out of time. Um, I want to we want to take ten minutes for um, questions. And before questions, I just want to quickly say there's eleven Catholic hospitals in New Jersey. One thing that we're trying to do at Public Rights um, Private Conscious Project um, is work with local reproductive rights groups, LGBTQ groups, to push for proactive legislation that would um, prevent healthcare providers from using critical services. So if anyone's interested in working on a project like that, please speak to me um, after this talk. Okay, and now we're open for questions. Just a kind of a quick question. I don't know if I missed it, but is there, um, kind of nationwide, I know it'll be different state by state, but is there, do we see that there are more Catholic hospitals than there are secular hospitals in most places, or is that, um, in most places, I mean, I was gonna say, uh, no, I don't know of anywhere where there are more. So at least in Alaska, it's about almost 50 percent oh, right. Catholic, but but there are, I believe, 75 or so communities where a Catholic hospital is deemed the sole provider in the area, which is based on distance and driving times. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm having trouble understanding um, the purpose of uh, Catholic hospitals and also. Um, like why they're able to, I guess, legally and even policy-wise, able to push these doctrines and kind of dictate how women or people in general uh, accept health care. Um, sure. Well, no, I mean, there's, uh, you know, I think there's a, um, you know, of course, you know, there's no constitutional right to health care, unfortunately, and um, there is a constitutional right to abortion, but not really to access abortion. I mean, it's, it's become almost this theoretical right that um, has been, you know, chipped away and chipped away and chipped away, chipped away at um, from the moment Roe was decided. 
Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are, um, you know, tort laws and other laws that do ensure, um, a, you know, some measure of protection for healthcare. And I think, as I said, like, it's just, it has yet to be seen um, what a court is going to do in the event that there's this clash of rights where we see someone where they can't make this kind of silly argument that this person that is actually not harmed, right? And we're, you know, what a court will do when they're faced with the fact that there are these laws on the books saying that um, in order to, the, and the idea by them, behind them is the, um, they are justified as a protection of religious freedom, but where there is this conflict between this, um, and, and the right to religious freedom has been like expanded in ways that you know I think are inconceivable to folks a while ago. I mean, we have a case like Hobby Lobby where they're saying this um, international massive for-profit company has religious freedom rights. I mean, that's not kind of the traditional way we think of as the right to free exercise of religion. So now, you know, we're having an <coughs> expansion of protections where you're seeing this massive entity, this massive ho hospital system that's providing health care to an entire community, um, if not man many communities, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's being used um, to allow them to uh, refuse something that is part of their core mission, which is to protect people's health. Um, but I, I think, um, I feel like there is a strong argument that that is just a, a gross overreading of what those re original religious liberty laws were intended to do. Um, you know, they're really, the first wave of them were really intended to protect this, you know, individual doctor who doesn't want to, you know, perform an abortion. But they've been so vastly expanded that um, I feel like the way that they are being interpreted by Catholic hospital systems and by the ERDs um, is just uh, grossly overexpansive, and that uh, individual, you know, tort law and other healthcare protections um, should override those. those I, I feel, I'm going to answer you. you. You started out saying, what's the purpose of Catholic health systems? And I feel in good faith in defending the Catholic health care systems were many often created in a vacuum when there was no health services to people. Okay? They have a history, and the sisters that you meet running these organizations will espouse their commitment to the poor, the downtrodden, and the vulnerable. And they have a mission of healing and providing care. They have a different concept of what that care is going to be. All right? It is not like they're there to deprive people of their health. They have a different concept. I mean, the same way I'm not going to... You know, we had major divides when I lived in Calcutta, like pro-Mother Teresa, not Mother Teresa. You know, she picked up people who were dying in the streets so she could, um, she could bless them before they died, and she didn't provide any health care, all right? They, these institutions have a long history. They are coming into conflict with a more secular view of what constitutes treatment, what constitutes a proper care, for women under certain circumstances, and they had made decisions, philosophical decisions, that they are going to, that they do not consider this proper care. So I, I think that's the, the issue of, you know, when you talk about liability. What's the proper standard of care, number one? And then if they do not provide the proper standard of care, then there's issues of liability. At best, and I don't know, you know, we hear horror stories, but my understanding, probably many institutions will inform people and, and refer them to someplace else. Do you understand? I, I, it's not a matter that they're going to deprive somebody of, um, of care. On some cases, some institutions prohibit them from making referrals. And so what we're talking about in these other situations it's unclear to me what the biases were that these women were treated and informed of what their situation was. So I just want to tell you that Catholic institutions, in their practice of religion, have played a very, very important institutional role uh, historically. And as I say, the Bon Secours system, when I did some history, they started out as midwives in medieval France during the Revolution. So they were providing care to women who previously didn't get any care. 
Uh, Dean, yeah. Yeah. Over here. <coughs> Are there any obligations or, the, or could the legislature look at at least giving notice to people of what services will not be covered yes. so that if you go to a hospital, you're told we will not do this, we will do not honor end of life directives, we will not, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you have sepsis, we are not going to do the care that you need, you know, whatever yeah. it is that they are obligated to at least let people know, well, I've got to go somewhere else. So is, yeah. is that an, a possible avenue? That's what we're going to try to um, push for in um, in New Jersey, and 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 just in response to what Renee said. I mean, I, I do believe that. Um, well, it's a myth that Catholic hospitals um, offer more charitable care than um, other hospitals, um, and also um, they 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 turn away people for certain types of care based on religious ideology and not what any concept of um, medical standards of proper care and um, and we also know that you know they don't sometimes they do refer people but there are certain services they just don't offer that people really sure. need actually and everyone has the right especially with women who particularly um, are in need of those people <coughs> of color of, um, of good standards of care um, so I wanted to, to to just express that point. And as far as legislation, um, yeah, I mean, they, there are a number of states, um, New Mexico, um, Washington, um, have introduced legislation saying that a Catholic hospital, if they're going to refuse care, then they have to refer or give notice. Um, we're not sure, and we're going to try to push for um, similar uh, legislation in New Jersey. Uh, Illinois actually passed an amendment. It was very moderate amendment, just saying that the Catholic hospital um, has to give referral and notice. The legislation that I was referring to earlier said they have to give referral notice, or if the person's in emergency need of care, they have to treat that person. Um, the legislation that was just um, recently passed in the amendment to the Conscious Care Act in Illinois that was recently passed was very moderate. They didn't say they had to treat, they said they had to refer or notice. Um, and that was that's held up in court because crisis pregnancy centers, um, they said that that would require, compel them to speak, to give in, so to give that type of notice would repel them, compel them to speech. And, um, to speak in a way that they're against, so it's against their First Amendment rights. So right now that's not going to move forward, and, and we're very skeptical that um, such legislations could, can be passed in New Jersey, but um, because of the fact that it's going to be a big pushback from the Catholic Church, but we're hoping at least through our campaign work around legislation to educate people about, around the directives. And I'll just very quickly say that there's a case before the Supreme Court right now where California passed a law requiring crisis pregnancy centers to disclose to the public that they um, do not have actual licensed medical providers on staff, and that case was challenged uh, as a violation of the free speech clause. That's <laughs> not even possible. No, no, I think we have time for one more question over there. Okay. Specifically about the uh, policy initiatives out of this, uh, out of this report, mm -hmm. um, in addition to uh, a, a notice uh, clause or something of that nature, mm -hmm. um, has there been any uh, motion towards coalition building? Because I know there are uh, uh, factions of um, the Catholic Church. I, I believe that the nuns on the bus, um, <laughs> if you've heard of them. Catholic um, Church. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. uh, like, building coalition with them to possibly um, somehow encourage the uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops yeah. to amend the, the ERDs, um, specifically because it doesn't, uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops doesn't exactly sound like they have a lot of women in no, <laughs> they don't. Uh, yeah. put in their decision making. Yeah, I mean, do you want to? I mean, we've certainly, we've, we've, you know, set their forth the Catholics for Choice. They do amazing work. Um, I, I don't think they're terribly persuasive to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. So I, I feel like that would be quite a, uh, quite a feat on their end if they could convince them to do that. But that said, we uh, they're very important allies and um, absolutely, you know, we, we uh, want to work with them. And, and 
Yeah, but in other words, like with the work, so that's what we're trying to do stuff on the state level. We feel like on the federal level, and even especially the Catholic Conference of Bishops, not much we can do, but possibly there's um, a chance to pass legislation on the state level that will push back against these laws. If you want to work on such a campaign, talk to me. Please. <laughs> talk. Okay, well, thank you for um, staying yeah, in there with us. And, uh, <laughs>